Get your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 9, verse 8 through 21. That's a lot of verses, but some of y'all ain't read your Bible all week. And look at your neighbor and say, I'm in between fights. Mm. <laughs> Just come out of one and don't know what I have to fight, but in between fights. Now we're jumping in in the middle of a, of, a, of a Bible story, a very common Bible story to those of you that have been in church a while. We're on the road to Damascus. We're not on the Jericho Road. We're on the road to Damascus. We're not on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. We're on the road to Damascus where everybody traveled by foot or by horse or by mule and we're we're watching the the man named Saul that you know as Paul have an encounter with God on the road to Damascus and I'm going to set this up for you but that's why we're jumping in the middle of it I want you to understand that Saul has been knocked off his beast by the power of God have you ever had God knock you off your beast to get Saul's attention, he knocked him off a beast and showed a great light and, and disrupted everything in his life. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man blind. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight. Uh -huh. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And have seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Wait, 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 wait. The blind man still saw in a vision. Isn't that something? Yeah, insight. Yeah, no eyesight, but still got insight. He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias says, Lord, are you serious? I have heard by many of this man how much evil he have done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath and, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. And you want me to go pray for him? But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. See, you don't get to pick who God chooses. Yeah, he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, look at, look at what he said, look at what he said, look at what he said to the man he was scared of and he called evil, but just because God said that he belonged to him. He hadn't even laid hands on him yet, but he just, just called him on credit. Brother Saul, brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest have sent me and thou mightest receive, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened 
Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. Wait a minute. <laughs> and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? See, even back then people would bring up your past. <laughs> and came hither for that intent, and he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. That's the end of the text. The subject is in between fights. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we approach thy throne humbly before you, asking you to move in the midst of your people. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Have your way, great God, that you are. In Jesus' name, someone shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let's go to work. In order to appreciate the text, we have to look at the context in which the text is extrapolated from. The pretext tells us the atmosphere that exists during this time. It is an atmosphere of newness. It is an atmosphere of new beginnings. It is the disciples embarking on Christ's work without Christ physically being there. And they start the work of the Lord at a deficit because all through the synoptic gospels, they are referred to as the 12, but now they only have 11 because in the process of the crucifixion, Judas has hung himself and his guts have spilled out on the potter's field. So they have the name, the 12, but the reality is 11. Sometimes your name can be greater than your situation. And when your name doesn't have equilibrium with your situation, you wanna fix that thing so that you become authentically what they call you. And in the process of them attempting to fix it, they meet together and prayed and selected two men and they began to cast lots to see who would be Judas's re replacement. They cast lots and they cast lots and the lots fell on, the lot fell on Matthias and Matthias became in their view the replacement for Judas. And I'm not saying that he wasn't the replacement for Judas, but it is interesting to note that he didn't, that there's no recordings of Matthias doing anything amazing. No, no books written by him. There's disagreement about whether churches were founded by him. He's not mentioned any place in all of the epistles, but they had picked him by casting lots. In total contrast to that, God has chosen Saul, who we call Paul, to be a New Testament apostle. Now, Matthias, according to my research, had been walking with the disciples and around Jesus all the time. And in my carnal mind, it makes sense that Matthias would be a replacement because he is a witness to the miraculous power of God. Saul, on the other hand, has no real experience with the power of God, but rather than having experience with the power of God, he is totally opposed to Christianity. In fact, when he meets the Lord, he meets the Lord on the way to capturing more Christians to bring back to Jerusalem, though they were not yet called Christians, it was called the way. Yeah, and he was trying to find people who were in the way to bring them back to Jerusalem to persecute them. And yet he has an encounter with God. I couldn't help but think of the difference between, in the Old Testament, between King Saul, who was somebody that God gave Israel because they desired a king, 
and David whom God chose. <laughs> Many are called, but few are chosen. And in the Old Testament, Saul was called, but David was chosen. You will remember when the kingdom was rejected from Saul and Samuel was weeping, God said, why weepest thou over what I have rejected? I have found a man after my own heart. Look at the contrast between Saul and David. Saul is, it looks like a king. By all natural rights, he has every reason to be king. He has the stature and the demeanor of a king. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. He comes from the pedigree that is prophesied that he would be king. David comes from the house of Jesse. He, he, he doesn't have the pedigree or the background. He, 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 he's from the tribe of Judah. He doesn't have uh, the history behind him that connotes kingship. Saul stood a head and shoulders above all men. He had the right look, but David had the right anointing. <laughs> David had the right anointing. And while we pick people that look good, <laughs> God will pick people that are anointed for the service and for the task. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in this situation that is mirrored in the New Testament as a reflection of the old. Whereas we are talking about Saul versus David in the Old Testament. In the New Testament we're talking about Matthias. Is he the 12th apostle or is it Paul? Some would even argue that Paul is the 13th apostle. But my concern is, I don't see where Matthias ever did anything. And I'm a living witness. The folk I pick on my own, <laughs> I'm just going to let that hang out there. Because enough people laugh to, to let me know that you know what I'm talking about. Is there anybody in here that ever picked somebody on your own? cast lots, pick somebody because your mama was born in May and my mama was born in May and, and, and grandma's name was Thelma and your grandma's name was Thelma and it makes sense to you but everything that makes sense to you isn't what God has for you in fact, more times than not, God will pick something that makes no sense at all and raise it up and you'll be scared to receive it because what God has in his heart for you doesn't agree with what you had in your mind for you. So that's just the case here in the text, the very fact that, that, that Saul would be chosen was so shocking that even Ananias in his faithfulness to God did not really want to go lay hands on Saul because Saul was snatching people that followed Jesus and taking them and persecuting them. And yet Saul has an encounter with God. Somebody say an encounter with God. He has an, an encounter with God. And it is, it is not where somebody witnessed to him. It is not where somebody preached to him. It is not where somebody persuaded him. It, God did not use any human hand or sticks like lots to choose him. God stepped into Saul's life. And if you read the whole text, you will read it was a fight on the road to the Damascus. It starts out with a fight. There is a fight between God and Saul. Now Saul has gotten permission from the high priest to go down and attack Christians. He's got permission from the priest, but not from the one who the priest served. And he is credentialed to go down there and attack Christians. But God has another plan. He intervenes in his life. He disrupts his life and he starts a wrestling with him. A great light appeared and knocked him off of his beast. And then he said, who is it, Lord? And he said, it is Jesus whom thou persecuteth. Wait a minute, I got to talk about that a minute. Saul had never done anything to Jesus. He had only attacked those who followed Jesus. But Jesus takes it personal when you attack his kids. 
it is Jesus whom thou persecuted. You think you're just rounding up my disciples, but you're actually persecuting me. That's why we try to teach you that the battle is not yours, it belongs to God. Because people think they're fighting you, but they're not fighting you, they're fighting the God that anointed you. The battle is not yours and you don't have to get even and you don't have to feel bad because you didn't get the last word in and you don't have to fend for yourself and you don't have to struggle for yourself because God has a way of dealing with your enemies I prophesy to somebody your enemy is about to get knocked off his piece he's about to get knocked off his piece this is a radical warlike conversion. It is not a nice, easy conversion. It is not a polite conversion. It is not that somebody gave him a track. It is not that somebody prayed with him. It is not that somebody talked to him. It is not that somebody intellectualized him. God just came on the road and knocked it over. Oh God, have mercy. Glory to God. I'm just in my introduction. I'm trying not to get happy. But when I start thinking about all the things that God knocked over. Is there anybody in here that's had God knock over some stuff? Glory to God that was coming to get you and you knew it was coming to get you and God knocked it over. You, you, it might not be but 10 people in here but you're praising God not for a new car or a new house or a new job or a new place. You're praising God because when the enemy was coming at you, God knocked it over. Nudge somebody and tell them he knocked it over. They were after me and he knocked it over. They were after my job and he knocked it over. They were after my mind and he knocked it over. They were after my peace and he knocked it over. They were after my sanity and he knocked it over. They were after my family and he knocked it over. And I'm still praising God how God can overthrow the plans of the enemy, the tactics of the enemy, the wiles of the devil. When God gets ready to do it, you don't have to run out to the middle of Damascus his road. God will meet them in the middle of the road and knock them off their beast. Can I get about 10 seconds of praise for a knockover? Oh, it's going to be a knockover, a knockover, a knockover, a knockover, a knockover. God can knock it over. Do him on his back. Knock him to the floor. And he says, who is it, Lord? And the Lord said, it is Jesus whom thou persecutest. This alone is enough to make you be careful about who you attack. Because you can inadvertently be attacking Jesus, fighting people, and get knocked over because you didn't even realize who you was fooling with. Saul has no idea that it is Jesus that he is persecuting. He, anytime you get in the way of God's purpose with your opinion, your opinion does not equate to God's purpose. God has a purpose and when God has a purpose your opinion don't amount to God's purpose and if you put your opinion in the way of God's purpose God's gonna knock it over it is Jesus who thou persecuteth and the Bible said that when Saul humbled himself that he when he got up he saw no man so walk, watch, watch, watch this, watch this, because you got to see this. This is a radical, this is a radical fight out here on the road to Damascus between a belligerent individual who is courageous enough to snatch people out of their house and drag them back to Jerusalem and a God who don't care nothing about his personality says, I will come against you. I don't care how tough you think you are and knocked him right over. It reminds me of Jacob being on Peniel and how he comes to Peniel and how God dealt with him and wrestled with him and brought him down and changed everything he thought about himself. 
His name, his destiny, his background, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Jacob had that kind of radical conversion. There are some people in this room that had a radical conversion. God just came into your life. You weren't planning for it. You weren't expecting it. You had no intentions of doing it. Some of y'all used to talk about church folk. Never thinking in your life that you would end up clapping your hands and jumping around in church today. Can we be real for a minute? Some of you never thought you'd be in the potter's house. And here you are sitting in the potter's house clapping your hand because God did something radical in your life to turn you around. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Some of you never thought you belonged to a big church. You said, I don't like big churches. I don't like being in crowd. But God has a way of knocking you off of your beach and sending you in a completely different direction. Is there anybody that can be real in here and be honest? A radical a radical conversion. A radical conversion. A radical conversion. We don't use the word conversion much in church. We don't talk about conversion and we don't talk about conviction. <clears throat> it used to be in the church they talked about conviction. People would come to the altar convicted. Now they come to the altar taking pictures. Now people come to the altar FaceTiming you and, and doing uh, 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 Facebook Live. You at the altar supposed to be looking for Jesus and you, don't, you, you think you're a film producer. But when conviction gets a hold to your life, you cut your camera off and lay down on the altar with tears running down your face because you've had a radical encounter with God. I'm not talking about coming up to the altar because your dress is cute. I'm not coming up to the altar because you want a picture to take home to show your friends you were there. You don't come to see me. You come to see Jesus. You don't come to see people. You come to see Jesus. You don't come because you're a film producer. You come to see Jesus. A radical conversion. I want all the folks who got convicted about your life and your mess and your stuff and the way you live to jump up on your feet and just bear witness that there's still some conviction left in the church. Conviction about sin. Conviction about evil. Conviction about wickedness. There still exists a convicting Holy Spirit. It's not just a dancing Holy Spirit. There's a convicting Holy Spirit. There's a Holy Spirit that will knock you off your beast bring you down to your knees, make you surrender, make you sell out. There's a convicting Holy Spirit that'll make you walk away from people you thought you couldn't live without. A convicting Holy Spirit that will disrupt you, that will change your life, that will make you uncomfortable with stuff you like. A convicting Holy Spirit that'll come into your life and speak to you about your nasty, sinful way. A convicting Holy Spirit that'll bring you down to your knees and make you surrender to God and say yes to God. I don't care how long you've been doing it. And because we have little conviction, we have little conversion. Because you can't have true conversion until you have true conviction. Glory to God. I can't make you be convicted. I can't talk you into being convicted. You have to have an encounter with God that shows you yourself. And all of a sudden you see him like you've never seen him before. Who is it? It's Jesus whom thou persecuted. And he shows up as light. Jesus shows up as light. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus shows up as light. Stop making choices in the dark. Jesus shows up as light. He illuminates situations. He'll show you perspectives. See, the problem now, all the prophets can see everybody but themselves. 
I'm a little bit leery of people who know what you ought to do but don't know what they ought to do. How, how come you can see my life and you can't see your life? How come you can see my child but you can't see your child? There you are talking about my child. Your child was out there with my child. Shut up. Did I say that out loud? Oh, I did. I said it out loud. 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 He had a moment with God. I'm going to talk to you about four things. I'm going to talk about the moment, the misfit, the messenger, and the message. The moment, the moment, the moment, the moment. It's a moment. It's a moment. That's how salvation reaches you. Boom! It's a moment. The moment, the misfit, the messenger, and the message. He had a moment with God. A moment with God that disrupted everything he knew about himself. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He knew that about himself. He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee the most conservative group. He was a Pharisee. Concerning the law, he was zealous. He was committed to what he believed. And he had lived all of his life up under the law. And in one moment, it was all disrupted. Do you not know, I don't care how long you've been in a religion, I don't care how long you've been following an idea, I don't care how many generations it's been in your family, one moment with Jesus can radically revolutionize your life. Somebody listening at me, you're trying to hold on to your traditions and get a little bit of Jesus, and you like some of the stuff Jesus said, and you think that religion is a smorgasbord. I have a cup of this, and a little bit of that, and a little bit of the other, and I'll mix it all up together me and God got my own thing no if you encounter Jesus you got to give up everything you encountered before and walk away from it that's why Paul said I counted all as dung everything I knew everything I learned everything I lived for I had a radical moment with God that changed my value system my values have been misaligned and all of a sudden Paul who was leading men ends up being led by the men he was leading and they had to lead him because he was blind because God said I'm going to shut your eyes till you get this right I'm going to shut you down till you get this right I'm going to shut up your finances till you get it right. I'm going to shut up your strength until you get it right. God has a habit of shutting you down till you get it right. Especially when you're stubborn. Especially when you're hard-headed. Especially when you like to fight. God knows how to shut you down. He said, I'm going to bring you to a place of vulnerability where you're going to need the people that you used to lead. And they're going to have to lead you as I bring you into the truth. It was the moment. It was the moment that changed the rest of the moments for the next 2,000 years. And God didn't trust no evangelist to do it. He appeared unto Saul on the road to Damascus. Now, part of the criteria of being an apostle is to be an eyewitness to the resurrection. And Saul wasn't at the tomb, so Jesus did a special appearance. <laughs> oh, God. God will do a special appearance. He'll come in your room. He'll come in your hotel. He'll come in the club. He'll come in the bar. God will do a special appearance. He'll come right where you are and just show up. Glory to God. Somebody holler, he showed up. He showed up in my life. I wasn't planning to get saved. He showed up. When I came back to the club, I went to Columbus. I brought two sets of clothes. I said, I'm going to go to the convocation, and at night I'm going to the club. I never got to use the second set because he showed up. I packed all my sharp stuff, too. I was going to be clean, baby. 
I was going to be clean. I put a couple of suits in there, you know, give God a nod. How you doing, Jesus? Yeah. I'm going to the club. Quick change after church. Never made it to the club. Because he showed up. Next thing I know, I'm walking down the aisle with tears running down my face. And Mother McCaslin was singing all of my life, I'll say yes, Lord. And I'm crying in an offering, coming back to the Lord. Have you had a moment with Jesus? Or do you just go to church? Have you had a moment with Jesus or is there a nice looking girl in this church and you're coming over here because you're trying to convince her that you, you and Jesus, are you cool? We cool, I'm cool. Give Jesus a nod. You know, it's really you I'm after. You can experience the potter's house and not experience Jesus. You can experience me and not experience Jesus. If you have a moment with Jesus, it will radically change your perspectives, your attitudes. And look at how, look at how, how Jesus wrecked everything that, that Saul's life was built on. It suddenly in one moment it's gone. You can't be a member of the Sanhedrin and preach Jesus. You can't be a Pharisee and preach Jesus? You can't be zealous concerning the law and teach grace? Wow. It changed his head. It changed his identity. It changed his personhood. It changed everything about him. He wiped the, God wiped the slate clean. Completely clean. This is why you hear Paul saying over, I profess to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. He is not going to fall into the trap of thinking he's smart again. He spoke in five different languages and he says, I am a fool for Christ. I don't hear what I'm saying. And he has a moment with God alone with nobody there but the men who were with him and they're leading him. They're leading him into Damascus and this is not how he planned to go into Damascus. He didn't plan to come into Damascus blind, being led by men. He planned to come into Damascus strong, attacking men, snatching women out of the house. But it doesn't always end up like you thought. Just because you think something right now doesn't make it true. He comes into Damascus helpless. The powerful man is now helpless, blind, groping, depending on them to lead him. And God tells him to go to a man he doesn't even know named Ananias. And there he is on a street called Street. Doesn't even know Ananias' address. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And Ananias, when God tells Ananias to pray for Saul, he says, are you serious? Uh, Saul of Tarsus? You want me to pray for him? You want me to go pray for him? See, we get in these cliques. And sometimes we won't pray for people because they're not in our clique. I'm not praying for no Democrat. I'm not praying for no Republican. I'm not praying for no white folks. I'm not praying for no black folks. I, I went through something. You don't know what I went through. I don't care what you went through when you was a child. God will humble you down because God does not promise to always use who looks like you, votes like you, dresses like you to bless you. 
God uses whoever he wants to use. He don't meet with you. He doesn't do a poll. He doesn't do a census. He doesn't meet with the committee. He doesn't need board approval. When God gets ready to snatch it, oh, y'all got quiet. When God gets ready to snatch somebody, he will snatch somebody. Ananias doesn't want to be seen with Saul. It's bad for his brand. It's bad for his reputation. It could be bad for his life. And yet, God says, he prayeth now. There ought not be nothing that supersedes the command of God in your life. When God says forgive, forgive. When God says let it go, let it go. When God says it'll all be over in the morning, it'll all be over in the morning. When God says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, he don't ask you how you feel about it. it well, Lord, I just don't feel like it. I don't feel like it's morning. It don't feel like morning to me. Shut up. If God says it's morning, it's morning. It may still be dark outside, but it's morning. You do know that morning starts in the dark. When God says it's morning, it's morning. So he wants you to rejoice like it's morning. He wants you to shout like it's morning. He wants you to move like it's morning. And Ananias, he wants you to go down to a street called Straight and pray for a man who was coming to kill you. Good God of mercy. How do you pray for a man who was coming to kill you? A man you have art against. That's why God won't accept your gift if you have malice in your heart. He said, leave your gift at the altar and reconcile yourself with your brother because whatever they did, it ain't worth you losing your authority with God. Whatever they said, it ain't worth you losing your power with God. No matter how it hurts you, it doesn't matter. You still got to do what you got to do. And if God says do it, you got to do it. See, we don't use this word anymore, the old word, obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I appreciate whatever you sowed, but obedience is better than sacrifice. You can't give your way into getting a license to do wrong. So Ananias obeys God and he goes down there and he lays hands on the man who was going to lay hands on him. Can you do it? No, seriously. Can you do it? Can you lay hands on the person who was coming to hurt you? Ananias lays hands on Saul who was going to lay hands on him. And the power of his obedience caused the scales to fall from Saul's eyes. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm talking to somebody that if you would just do what God says do and stop wrestling with your ego and your pride and humble yourself, the, the power you would have. The scales fall from his eyes and suddenly Saul can see and he goes from having a moment with God to a moment as a misfit. I want you to feel this. How can he go back to the Sanhedrin court and tell them about Jesus? Because he is no longer one of them. There is no seat for him amongst the Sanhedrin. He's lost all of that. He's lost all credibility with the Sanhedrin because he has taken on this Jesus philosophy that they hated. 
they have empowered him to attack what he has become. <laughs> so he, he she got me tickled. So so he can't he can't go back. There is a point in God. It's not that you don't want to go back. It's not that you ain't tempted to go back. It ain't that your flesh don't want to go back. But there is a point in God where you cannot go back. <clears throat> That's somebody's word watching right now. You cannot go back. You can't go back and undo what God has done in your life. You can't unknow what you know. Once you know who Jesus is, you can't unknow that. I don't care how you drink, how much weed you smoke, how high you get. I don't care how many lap dances you get. Once you know Jesus, there's a mark on your life that something is always going to be missing until you say, yes, you can't go back. The problem, however, is not just that he can't go back because I can leave one group if I connect with the other. I can, I can, I can, I can be rejected by this group if I'm accepted by the other. The problem with Saul is when he comes to the apostles, they don't believe in him. They don't believe him. They don't believe in him. They don't like him. They don't accept him. And so he has to accept being a misfit. You have to accept being a misfit. You can change your hair, you can change your clothes, you can change your style, you can change your walk, they still not gonna like you. Because when God has called you out, you can't go back in. You have to accept being a misfit. Look at somebody say, I'm different. <laughs> I'm different. You ain't never seen nobody like me before. You're never going to see anybody like me again. I'm different. And after years and years of low self-esteem and crying about it, I'm finally starting to accept that I'm different. I'm cool with it. I'm okay with it. I can live with it. I understand it. I've been trained in it. I learned how to be a misfit. It doesn't matter that you don't like me and it doesn't matter that you don't believe in me. I can stand on my own because I had an encounter with Jesus. And so when Saul, who is now called Paul, starts to minister, he ministers from the place of a misfit. All my misfit people, hear me good. The reason you have the anointing is because you are misfit. The reason you have your anointing is because you're a misfit. Had they accepted you, you wouldn't have had the anointing. Had they embraced you, you wouldn't have had the anointing. Because Paul was a misfit, he gives us most of the New Testament epistles because he does not fit in with either group. He's an outcast on both sides, but when you're an outcast with men, you are in cast with God do you hear what I'm saying I'm talking to somebody I don't even know who it is you are misfit stop fighting it stop changing yourself stop redoing your philosophy stop trying to be what everybody else wants you to be you were meant to be a misfit your savior was a misfit the stone that the builders rejected has been made the chief cornerstone stop crying about it stop worrying about it stop being frustrated 
frustrated about it. You don't want to be in with them. God saved you from being in with them. He meant for you to be different. Look at your neighbor and introduce him. Say, hello, I'm different. Yeah, my name is different. My name is different. My walk is different. My talk is different. The way I think is different. The way I believe is different. The way I flow is different. I understand it if you don't like me. Everybody can't walk with a misfit. You have to be a misfit yourself to understand another misfit when you see it. I want some misfits in this room to give God a praise. You don't fit in with your family. You don't fit in with your community. You don't fit in with your neighborhood. You just a misfit for Jesus. Often it takes half your life to accept being a misfit. Because we are always advertised, marketed, modeled and promoted fitting in and it hurts to not quite be either one it's lonely it's lonely being a misfit when you are a misfit, you are misunderstood. They accuse you of being arrogant. They accuse you of being high-minded. They accuse you, we used to say, of being such a much. They accuse you of walking around with your head up in the air. They accuse you of forgetting where you came from. Come on, misfits, back me up on this. Being a misfit means that you have to learn to be okay with being misunderstood. That ain't easy. That ain't easy. That ain't easy. It was not easy to be the Apostle Paul. It was not easy to be shunned by your future and rejected by your past. It'll make you pray harder. Because you don't have nobody to depend on but the Lord. It'll make you get up and come to church on Sunday morning. I don't care how cold it is outside, you wrapped up and came to church because this is the only place you fit. Not the building, the presence of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the anointing of the Lord. This is a place where we feed the misfits. Hey, misfits, dinner is served. says that immediately Paul started preaching immediately ain't that something immediately he starts preaching in the synagogue he doesn't come back to the synagogue to be accepted he knows they think he's crazy but he's preaching in the synagogue. He has to fight all of his life. But in between the fights, he's writing most of the New Testament in between fights. He came to Lystra and they threw rocks at him and they stoned him till his head was busted and his back was bleeding and they, they drug him out of the city as half dead. But as soon as he woke up, he got in between the fight and started preaching again. 
saying stuff like there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk no longer after the flesh but after the spirit if any man be in Christ he is a new creature all old things are passed away the whole all things have become new for we know if this earthly house or tabernacle shall be dissolved we have another building eternal in the heavens uh, having this assurance uh, that God who has began a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ I want to talk to everybody in here that's been in fight after fight after fight the Lord said in between the fights preach the gospel lay hands on the sick uh, open up blinded eyes uh, rebuke the devil uh, and keep on going they put him on the boat and the boat fell apart he survived the shipwreck and the snake bit him but in between the fights he kept on telling them Jesus is Lord to the glory of God I wish I had a hundred people that would praise God in between the fight You're still God. You're still God. The ship has wrecked, but you're still God. The snake has bitten me, but you're still God. The rocks made me bleed, but you're still God. See, it ain't no praise till you're praising God with blood running down your face. There ain't no praise till you're praising God in the middle of rejection and pain. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'll give you 30 seconds uh, to give God a praise like you lost your mind. You got 10 seconds to open your mouth. Every misfit in the building, every misfit online, every misfit in the balcony, you got five seconds to open your mouth and give God some praise and settle in on being disliked, settle in on being controversial, settle in on being mistreated. It's okay. This is why it's okay. So, 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 this, is, this is why it's okay to be a misfit. Because number three, you're the messenger. And you can't be the messenger if you fit in. That's what's wrong now. We got too many folk trying to fit in. Too many preachers trying to fit in. If, if you're going to be the messenger, you got to be willing to be the misfit. Glory to God. You can't be common with the people that you're trying to lead. That's why we don't have parents no more, because they're too busy trying to be friends with their kids. Uh, you're so busy trying to be friends uh, that the kid ain't got no parent. Uh, and now if you're not a friend, you're not a parent. The devil is a lie. You got to understand that you got to be a misfit. You got to be a misfit if you're going to win this battle. If you're going to be a boss, you got to be a misfit. You can still be nice, but you ain't got no business chasing them behind people, trying to make them like you. This ain't no election. You're paycheck voted me boss I'm the boss you can't cash the check and not recognize who signed it come on we might as well clean it up in here look at somebody say clean it up you are the messenger you are the messenger 
you are the messenger. I don't care whether you're a preacher or not, you're the messenger. You're still a witness. You're a soul winner. Stop trying to be an undercover agent on your job. You don't want nobody to know that you say so that you still got permission to live out your old life. Go ahead and be a messenger. Start praying for people on break. You're a messenger. God didn't put you on the job to make money. He put you on the job to change lives. You could have made money anywhere. You're on assignment. You're a messenger. You got a message. You're on a mission. That's why the enemy keeps fighting you. It's because you're a messenger. He wouldn't try to shut you down if you didn't have something to say. The reason he's attacking you is because you're a messenger. I want every messenger in here to clap your hands. I'm a messenger. 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 But messengers get fought with being misfits. Because being a messenger means saying yes to being a misfit. So when the enemy wants to shut down your message, he'll show you how bad you don't fit. Am I preaching right? I say, am I preaching right? You are a messenger. Most of what we know about church, about the five-fold ministry, about the resurrection from the dead, about the mystery of the Godhead, about the peace that passes all understanding, about having peace with God, about no condemnation. Most of what we know about the resurrection came from Paul, not Matthias. Stop worrying about who they picked. God picked you. God picked you. I'm going to say it again. God picked you. I'm going to say it again. God picked you. And you don't have to be 80 and you don't have to be 70 and you don't have to be 60. You don't have to be 50. Jesus started ministering when he was 12 because God picked you. You have to understand that God picks you and it's not because your past is in alignment. It's because you had a unique moment with God and stop being frustrated because you can't teach people how to have a moment that they didn't have. Oh God, that's so good. Thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna watch this on YouTube again myself. Some of you that are messengers are frustrated because in your loneliness, you are trying to make disciples out of people who do not have your moment. And if they did not have your moment, they cannot have your mantle. Let me tell it to the people over here. If they did not have your moment, they cannot have your mantle. That's why Elijah told Elisha, if you see me when I'm taken up, you can have my mantle. You can't get my mantle just because you want it, just because you think you got a right to it, just because you gave me a love offering. You can't buy me off and get this. Until you've been knocked off your beast, until you've had an encounter with God, until you walked around blind, and until you're willing to be a misfit, You can't teach people how to be what they didn't see. So forgive yourself for not being able to reduplicate yourself. <clears throat> when Jesus picks out 12 disciples, y'all pulling at me now. When Jesus picks out 12 disciples, you know what the first thing he tells them? Take up your cross and follow me because you're going to hear me teach all you want to 
but you're not going to get my mantle off of what I teach. You're going to get my mantle off of what I suffer. So the invitation is, until you have a shared experience, You cannot receive my spirit without receiving my cross. Most of us are stuck in the misfit stage, hindering our message because we are still grieving over not fitting. And until you resolve and say yes, not only to God, but yes to not quite fitting in with either group. Yes to being peculiar. Yes to thinking different. Yes to having a flow that's different from other people's flow. You will never discover your message, which, your message, which is your purpose. Number four, your mess, because you are a messenger, your purpose is predicated on your message, not your emotions. God, God didn't call you for your feelings. He called you for your message because you are a messenger to a dying world to model what love looks like, what strength looks like, what maturity looks like, what diligence looks like, what commitment looks like, what fortitude looks like. In between fights, you got to keep teaching people how to be survivors. How to walk alone sometimes. Am I helping anybody? Let me tell you something. Most of the divorces that we're having, we should have never had. because we are trying to get something out of marriage that it is not designed to give you. You're taking marriage for therapy. And when you don't get therapy out of it, you get out of it. If you want therapy, go to a therapist. It is not my job to fix you. It is my job to love you. The reason I can't fix you is that I'm trying to fix me. And it is wrong of me to expect you to fix me because whatever's broke in me was broke when you bought me. I'm the house you bought as is. I'm a fixer-upper. The, the, <laughs> the drain don't work and the lights flash on and off and when it rains real hard, I leak in the kitchen, but I'm still your house. hear me and you are angry with me over stuff I don't know nothing about you trying to work out in me stuff you had going on with your daddy I'm trying to work out in you stuff I had going on with my mama that ain't even fair. You wasn't even there. You don't even know what happened. And if I tell you, you only get my side. <laughs> A 
and yes I got a devil to fight how many people in here are honest enough to say you got a devil to fight that's why I'm at church this morning because I got a devil to fight that's why I was clapping my hands and praising God when you were singing because I got a devil to fight that's why your job is so important because you helped me fight my devil that's why I can't cross my legs and look cute in church because I got a devil to fight and I came here this morning to get some ammunition to help me in the fight because when I leave this place I'm going back to the front lines and I'm going to have to do battle I'm not talking about doing battle with people I'm talking about doing battle with me doing battle with my own head doing battle with my own pain doing battle with my own self sometimes doing battle with my prophecy with my destiny am I ready can I handle it can I pull it off am I enough no I'm not enough but with God I'm more than enough I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me can I get a praise in this place can I get a praise in this place so when Paul gets down to the end of his life he sends a message to his mentee. He does not tell Timothy about all his revelations. He does not tell Timothy about all the places he traveled. He does not tell Timothy how he was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He does not tell Timothy how many languages he spoke in. He does not tell Timothy that he is solely responsible for the gospel reaching the Greeks. That he preached the gospel on Mars Hill until a whole nation got saved. He does not tell Timothy that it was not Peter alone that brought the gospel to Rome. But that's why the shipwrecked was to keep him from getting to Rome. Because when Paul got to Rome, the whole game changed. And the headquarters of Christianity slipped over from Jerusalem over to Rome. He doesn't tell him any of that. You know what he tells him? I fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. I did it when I felt like it. I did it when I didn't feel like it. I did it when things were going good. I did it when things were going bad. I did it when I was on the mountain. I did it when I was in the valley. I did it when people liked me. I did it when people hated me. I did it when they understood. I did it when they didn't understand. I have fought a good fight. And you got to learn how to clap for yourself and say, I have fought. Somebody clap for yourself. I fought a good fight. I raised some kids by myself. I'm a single mother, but I fought a good fight. Hallelujah. I divorced a mother, but I kept on taking care of my children. I fought a good fight. I fed people who didn't like me. I came to work where they talked about me. I kept on going to work even though the person I trained ended up getting the job I should have got, but I still came to work and I fought a good fight. I want to talk to some people that have been into some fights. I don't want to talk to these cutie pie people that ain't been through nothing yet. I want to talk to some real soldiers that's been in some real fights. Paul tells Timothy! I fought. I fought. I fought. A good fight. I fought fights other people wouldn't even take up. I fought fights I could have avoided. I fought a good fight. And you know what? I kept the faith. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Sometimes that was the fight. <laughs> Sometimes, see, y'all think I'm fighting with people. Sometimes the fight is to keep the f <laughs> I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. Wait on this. <clears throat> Here's what you've been waiting on. Now, laid up for me. is a crown of righteousness. Didn't get it when I wanted it. <laughs> Didn't get it where I worked at it. Some stuff only God can give you. Now laid up for me is a crown of righteousness. We used to sing stuff like, we shall behold him. Or that other song, the marketplace is empty. No more selling in the streets. The king is coming. We, we, we don't sing about heaven right now because we got better cars. <laughs> we don't sing about heaven because we got air conditioning. We don't sing about heaven because we got dishwashers and garbage disposals and stuff like that. But the truth of the matter is nothing you own is your crown. None of it is your crown. There is a crown for those of you who have fought a good fight. And it ain't down here. It ain't down here, bro. It ain't down here. Why would you preach this? Because every time I open up the paper, somebody else has committed suicide. You know why most people commit suicide? Because they never got the crown. They put in the fight, and they didn't get the crown. But Paul tells Timothy, now laid up for me is a crown of righteousness. And not for me only, but for all of those who await his appearing. Stand to your feet. If God spoke to you today, give him some kind of praise. <laughs> Quick teacher's review. Is in, make your life count in between fights. Don't survive a fight only to be in misery about an old fight. You wasted your free time talking about your old time. In between fights, make your life count. Do something purposeful. That's what the fight was about in the first place. In between fights, do what you were created to do. This is a teacher's review. The power of obedience. Understanding that sometimes you have to go against your feelings and obey God and lay hands on people who are trying to lay hands on you. Because this is not your business. This is God's business you're doing. Do you hear what I'm saying? Teachers review, I want you to understand you didn't choose God. God chose you. 
Teacher's Review. Fitting in is overrated. Be okay with being different. Nobody writes books about ordinary. Only extraordinary. Be cool with it. All of, not all, but most of our heroes were lauded after they died. If you demand payment up front, you are distracted from your destiny. Who am I talking to? When you worry about being a misfit, you put your happiness in the hands of someone else. It means I can only be happy if you like me. That's too much power to give to any clique, any group, any crowd, any co-workers. That's too much power to give anybody. You got to be cool with doing you. Yo, I often joke, talk about how my wife loves Christmas. And she got the house, you know, it looked like Santa Claus lived there. And, uh, and, and the one who always teasing her about it, I said, how come you ain't playing your music? You know why? It ain't my thing, but it's hers. And if it gives you joy, turn the music off. It takes a long time to stop trying to change people and just love them like they are. It ain't nothing wrong with that. I thought, I let me turn the music on. Let me help. Let me do something. Stop trying to make people into you. Cause can we be honest a minute? You ain't that happy being you. <laughs> so why are you trying to make me? Be you. Early in the message, I used two words that I said we don't use much. Conversion and conviction. Conversion, th the right to change, the right to be somebody else is important. Don't lock yourself into situations you can't get out of because you, conversion is a process. And conviction is the decision that I need to change directions. Now, I'm not sure, but I believe that somebody in this room or watching online has been knocked off your beast. The wind knocked out of you. Blackout. You can't see your way clear. God has disrupted your life because he's got something for you that's different than where you were headed. And you can be hard-headed and come to him on a cot lowered down through the roof or come to him in a dread disease or you can come to him now and say, Lord, 
I need to make some changes. Ain't no need in me having a new year if I'm not going to be a new me. Even if I am despised, even if I have to leave my clique, my gang, even if I have to change jobs, whatever I have to do to fulfill what you created me to do, I'm tired of fighting you, God. It's enough to fight me. You know what Jesus told uh, Paul that I left out? He said, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. The prick was something that they put at the end of the stall to stop the mule from kicking the stall, trying to get away. It was a sharp object that the more you kicked against it, the more it hurt you. And when God says it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, he said, you kicking against me and hurting you. 